organic matter, the solid organic matter uh, is increasing here. And, and so the, the microbes become more and more efficient in the acquisition uh, of, of the carbon and in, in the production of microbial biomass after this critical threshold. Okay, and so what does it now mean if we assume that soil organic matter is formed from microbial necromas, so from the dead microbes? Yeah, of course, when, when the, the microbial biomass is formed here very inefficiently, yeah, so we have very low levels of microbial biomass. And, um, yeah, and so most of the carbon we add to the soil is respired. And also if, if the farmers, yeah, you're seeing the, in the farming soil, they, they do not reach this, or they, they hardly reach this 1% threshold. So some soils are, are here, um, but most of the farm soils, they are, they are here in this range. That means when the farmers add carbon material, so organic matter input, but remain below the 1% carbon threshold, the system always is switching back to the inefficient state. Yeah, so most of the carbon is respired by the microbes and cannot be converted to microbial biomass. Okay, now coming back to the carbon saturation concept. Yeah, so when we think of this, and as in, if, if you look at the publications, how this is interpreted, yeah, the interpretation is, well, so we have a very rapid accumulation of, uh, of this uh, mineral associated stable microbial biomass. And then as the uh, threshold is reached, it becomes slower and slower and slower. What we have seen, what I've shown you now is that also at the beginning, this process is very slow. Yeah, and this actually, yeah, so carbon saturation slows as the threshold is reached. But uh, this is actually a figure of Jan Fruis from, from one of his publications. And just look at this figure here. So this is the initially mineral bound carbon content. And this is the mineral bound carbon change. So the change in the amount of carbon that is fixed to, as a stable fraction in, in the soil. And this curve shows also a minimum here. Yeah? It's not like this here, but it, it has also a minimum here. And, and I, I think, uh, yeah, so it's carbon saturation, this is, is uh, uh, clear evidence that carbon saturation is also slow at low soil organic carbon levels. And I think what, what we found in the chrono sequence gives some explanation for the inefficiency of soil organic matter formation at these low carbon levels. Yeah? So the, in the Czech Republic, so the reclaimed, the reclaimed soils, they have already quite some organic carbon because this is, this is fossil carbon from a, a forest, a former um, lake sediment that is in, in, in their uh, uh, materials. This is something we do not have in, 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 uh, in the Western German sites. Yeah, so we, we start at a very much lower carbon level here. Okay, to sum this up, so um, so what, what I showed you is that um, the potential for carbon saturation, carbon formation is definitely not reached in the agricultural soils. It does not impede productivity of those soils. Yeah? So that's something else. But if we think of climate change and, and the carbon storage potential of soils, yeah, so our aim should be to increase the potential of these soils in carbon storage. And we now have a project, uh, follow up project, where um, agricultural sites are uh, uh, fertilized with, with um, compost mm -hmm. and brought above this 1% carbon threshold. And now we will see in the coming years whether our theory is correct and whether these soils then really are on a different stable state and, and accumulate more carbon uh, above this threshold. Um, 
we have seen that the young salts, they have high variability in, in the salt CN ratio, it's stabilizing later on. And yeah, and this was the important thing. Yeah, so there's a microbial stoichiometric threshold at 1% carbon. And this was also the critical uh, measure for the carbon use efficiency of these soils, yeah, measured as uh, maintenance respiration. Okay, and, and all this was financed by uh, the German Ministry of uh, Education and Research. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions? Okay, I thank you. Maybe because time moves, so I will just start to keep continue on that. Okay, thanks. And I will share my presentation, uh, which will basically follow up will basically follow up on this. I just, um, can you see it? I just try to put it in full screen mode. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. So I just want to go back to one question I have yesterday about this compaction. And I basically pull from literature some response of different plants to compaction and you can clearly see that the optimum for uh, that the optimum for trees would be somewhere around one while the optimum for grasses would be somewhere about 125 yeah? so the grass is actually like much more compacted soil than trees and also decrease in trees grow which compaction is much steeper than for grass and the herbs are somewhere in between those. Okay, uh, there was another thing so I want to mention related to discussion yesterday. That when we study post mining sites, we often have some problem with the fossil carbon, which can be there. And I can go back to that in discussion. But when we speak about accumulation of carbon in my lecture, I actually I actually try to, uh, you know, avoid this problem. So we somehow subtracted the fossil carbon. And now I'm going a little bit repeat what was uh, said just before by Professor Bunkowski. And this is a diagram you have already seen. So once the carbon starts to accumulate in soil, it's basically saturate the uh, uh, this occluded carbon and this mineral bound carbon. And then there is this non-protected carbon. This is actually the data about carbon storage in different uh, layers of soil and on, along extremely long kernel sequence of landslide. So we have landslide, the youngest one was four year old and the oldest one was 13,000 years old. And you can actually see that this stage basically, when the mineral soil gets saturated, can happen quite quickly, and it's a, it's a less than hundred years. So this this mineral sat saturation of mineral soil from nothing, from uh, you know very disturbed soil, can happen in a few decades basically. And here you have a, can see this is something around seventy years, and then. In forest soil, when you have large input of litter, you might get actually increasing equilibrium of litter storage or carbon storage in forest floor, which is basically non-protected carbon. And this equilibrium is driven by completely different processes. Also, I would like highlight in this, you know, we already see that this initial speed of carbon storage in succession can be very fast. So this is another evidence of that. This is basically rate of carbon storage per ton per caton carbon per hectare a year in different mining sites. And you can see in very young mining sites, you can store as much as two ton carbon per year per hectare. This is very extremely high carbon storage. If you use arable land and if you plant forest on arable land, 
you get a slope as 300 kilograms, so 0.3 tons. So this is almost 10 times more. So basically, as a practical consideration that uh, reforestation of this uh, disturbed sites actually brings more carbon to soil, and it's also uh, actually important carbon offset of the mining. It's not kind of com offset completely, but it's interesting. And when we are looking on the soil processes, there is this organic matter that came by root and litter. An interesting effect on soil actually is that unlike the above ground ecology, when you know if you have something and the something happened more or less immediately, in soil you have very long legacy. So if the carbon gets accumulated, if the clays get saturated, there's no accumulation anymore. And as we see in previous uh, slides, you know, the microbes basically works quite differently than, uh, than before. So, uh, so this is, this is, uh, this is something uh, also which needs to be remembered that these, uh, this, there is the legacy and, you know, every organism that act in soil, this is, for example, a soil fauna effect. And, you know, it consists from different processes, some of which affect system more immediately in a small scale and short time. And some of them might accumulate over time. You know, if many plants leave their root exudates and many microbes change, the saturation point in these aggregates eventually also profile before become saturated and all soil behavior uh, is going to change. Yeah? So this legacy have also this possibility of magnifying small effect over time to spatially and temporally, uh, you know, spatially more important and temporally more persistent effect. Certainly, the soil development is affected by abiotic processes like weathering, and the weathering, you know, change uh, uh, suitability, change texture, change uh, uh, ability of plant to grow there. I just want to show that this, of course, over time, the weathering might improve, you know, suitability for plant, but it's not, not always happening. You know, in some substrate, if they get more weathered, they might actually release some uh, metals or some salts, which can make it even less suitable for plants. And this is often happening in mining sites. So you might have initially even some vegetation establishment, and then the ongoing weathering this might be worse. But I'm not going to speak about that. When we look on soil, we actually see that soil under microscope is very structural thing and is actually the structures on a large extent affected by soil biota. So we see here earthworm cast and here is earthworm cast in detail. We see some millipede feces. And when we look on this worm cast under the microscope, we actually see these bacteria and these bacteria are surrounded by clay minerals, which are these lines around them. And when the bacteria die, actually this grayish uh, layer, which actually means extracellular, you know, cell walls, it stays attached to the minerals. And this actually represents this necromass, this microbial necromass that can be stored in long term and form substantial part of the soil organic matter. And this is actually happening inside of these soil uh, earthworm cast, because inside this earthworm cast, many tiny pieces of organic matter are mixed. And around each of these pieces, you know, organic uh, matter and nutrients can leach out from that small piece and support microbial activity in surrounding. So basically, 
to promote the process, Professor Bronkowski just speaking about storing this microbial necromass, formation this occluded carbon in soil, which is highly supported by a perturbation, particularly in forest soil, is very important process. We can actually, when we're looking in different forest soil, we can actually distinguish different degree in which this perturbation happen. And this is related to litter quality. So typically, if the trees are living in nutrient poor conditions, they keep most of the nutrients for themselves and they produce only little amount of litter. They have thick leaves, you know, that for needles that last for long. They are often evergreen and produce quite low amount of litter, which decompose very slowly, which means it's accumulate on the soil surface and for more type of humus. In the contrary, in the forest like alder forest or in meadows, when there is litter with a low CN ratio, the tree, the, the plants grow fast. They produce thin leaves because they have enough nutrients. They want to have high speed of photosynthesis. And these thin leaves cannot hold for long. So they came to soil and they are decomposed quickly. They produce a lot of these microbial necromas that can be stored. And this released nutrients actually get stored in organic matter in soil and plant can access them. And this actually caused fast recycle of nutrients, but also fast buildup of mineral organic matter. So this is just how the soil in nature looks like. This typically is happening in different climatic conditions. So typically, you know, these sandy soils, uh, poor in nutrients occur in places when there is a lot of precipitation and vice versa. However, uh, in mining sites, we have the same substrate and we can actually see how trees or generally how vegetation, which different litter quality, which different strategy, which different growth strategy, which produce different litter, how they can actually derive soil development in different pathways. And this is actually what we are seeing now and we will be focusing particularly on carbon and how the carbon is affected by this. So this is picture you already see it's a succession sites on the top and reclamation sites on the bottom. Reclamation sites in this case is alder plantation. Alder brings a lot of nitrogen and that's basically allow more faster nutrient turnover. While the species that colonize the succession sites are goat willow, aspen and birch, which have much slower growing strategy, keep more nutrients for themselves and so on. This is reflected by degree of perturbation. You basically see a more perturbation in reclaimed sites and less perturbation in these unreclaimed sites. And this corresponds with amount of soil fauna in different groups. If I really want to make this short, I would say, in these reclaimed sites, you have more earthworms and you have more like millipedes or some bigger diptera larvae, which actually take part in the fragmentation of litter and mixing it to mineral soil. While in these unreclaimed sites at the beginning, you have more uh, groups which actually like to live in this accumulation of fermentation layer on the surface, like protozoa or some oribatid mites. And this is basically the same in the graphs. So you see already in 23 years old reclaimed sites, there is large amount of soil formed by earthworm cast. And this is not happening in uh, unreclaimed sites of the same age because there is no earthworms. It takes them much longer to colonize the sites. And that's why there is no mixing. However, in 40 years old site, uh, successional site, the earthworms are coming. They actually change the soil. They change the soil, they start to be formed by 
uh, by earthworm cast. And this actually affect all soil profile formation. We already mentioned this uh, coming, the worms is actually uh, affected by previous development of vegetation, which have to form, you know, suitable conditions for them, accumulation of enough plants as you use the earthworms can feed on. Once the earthworms colonize the sites, it start chain of events. This, for example, is soil which is not affected by earthworms in orange, and which is affected by fauna, which was earthworm particularly. In this case, which is blue, which is brown, and you see that uh, soil, which worms actually can store more water. These are different. Uh, limits, but important is this middle one, which is water field capacity. And you can see this is clearly higher when the worms are present. This incorporation actually also affects pH, it increases availability of phosphorus, and it also changes composition of decomposer food web. When we speak about decomposer food web, we basically speak about two major channels. The one is a fungal channel. The fungal channel actually starts by hardly decomposable litter on which mostly fungi are growing. It usually occur in acidic pH and it prefers situation when the litter lays on the soil surface. While the bacteria channel is typical, typically starts by bacteria which are feed by protozoa, which are feed by nematodes so because there is much more trophic level than in fungal channel, there is a fast mineralization of organic matter, then all these can be fed by you know, earthworms and some other macrofauna, and it promotes this storage we already speak about. So this bacterial channel is typically promoted in situation when litter is mixed to the soil, either by worms or human activity. And we can actually see that in this stage before the worm came and litter accumulated in soil surface, the fungal channel dominate. And once the earthworm came here, the bacterial channel again starts to be more pronounced. And we also already mentioned that this effect actually result in a presence of humus layer in soil, this organo mineral layer, which promotes establishment of more demanding plant species and push forward plant succession. Uh, this is actually not happening uh, in this middle stages of succession. And we see very good establishment of late succession species of trees, as we speak about, and we already speak about it's actually related. Uh, this ectomycorrhizae uh, establishment. And I would like to show that this worm invasion can actually affect this mycorrhiza uh, coexistence. You might know we might have we have two we have several species several types of mycorrhiza. Among them, arbuscular mycorrhizae is more widespread. Most plants use that one. Most temperate trees, however, use ectomycorrhizae. Basically, when we push these blocks of these frames, when we push them to soil in these successional sites, we actually all of a sudden see plants growing there. And we actually see that inside this frame, arbuscular mycorrhizae are more common. And then we look on that more detail, and we basically found that around these trees, the sites are dominated by uh, activity of ectomycorrhizae, while in these grass patches, there is a dominance of uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae measured here as a neutral, uh, neutral lipids. And when we grow in the pots, ectomycorrhizae and endomycorrhizae plants, 
we can actually see that ectomycorrhizae plants is going to win once they are growing in post mining soil. But when we treated that soil, which earthworm for one year, then, and then we do the same uh, experiment, the same treatment, we actually see that the effect, the, the negative effect of ectomycorrhizae plants on endomycorrhizae plant, arbuscomycorrhizae disappear. So basically we can say that in poor environment, ectomycorrhizae are going to win, but in the better environment, more nutrient rich, the arbuscomycorrhizae are going to win. So this is actually also the reason why in this alder plantation, we have lower success of this oak and beech and spruce because of competition of ecto and endomycorrhizae. This butterbation affect all range of parameters, not only, you know, uh, not only mycorrhizae, but uh, amount of carbon which is stored in soil, we already in particular in mineral soil and many other, many other things. So basically we can see here, uh, you know, scale of processes from incorporation of organic matter into the aggregates, which promote formation of microbial necromass. Uh, uh, this has happened on the level of aggregates, and these aggregates gradually form all soil profile. The all soil profile change condition for plant grow, and this might actually stimulate the grow of mass, more fast growing plants who will actually uh, promote this even more. But at some moment, this carbon gets saturated uh, in the soil, and then the more conservative plants start to be actually more advantages for carbon storage. So I'm actually here going to show you how a different species of trees can support carbon storage. I already showed this slide. This has happened in one large heap and we have seven different species of trees and we actually measure carbon storage if I mean carbon storage, we actually adapt amount of carbon, uh, increased amount of carbon above this fossil pool of carbon, which was already there, yeah? And uh, so we uh, measure three biomass, we measure carbon. And again, you might notice that these alder plantation after 40 years, produce up to 15 centimeter of a horizon, uh, which is very fast. If you read in some textbook that millimeter of soil, you know, gets created thousands of years. So this soil apparently didn't read the book. And again, carbon storage is very fast as we speak about that. This is uh, quite com uh, common initial uh, stages of soil development. And so we see this is amount of carbon stores in several dozen of tons, and the most is stored in alder and lime, and the less is stored in the spruce pine trees. This is basically CN ratio of the litter of these trees, and this is soil depth in terms of a horizon and in terms of uh, uh, you know, forest floor thickness, so basically fermentation layer or OA layer thickness. And what you can see here, the lower is CN, the deeper is A horizon, and vice versa, the higher is CN, there's basically higher tendency to accumulate OA layer. And also the, the lower is CN, the more air swarms we see and vice versa. So not surprisingly, carbon storage in these sites is highly correlated with uh, earthworms activity, which proportion of this worm cast in soil profile and also which earthworm density. 
and we actually try to measure how much else from you know mix carbon to soil and we can actually see that amount of carbon which is respired or leached is about the same uh, if the worms are present or not. So basically worms were present in this, absent in this. But what you can see that most of this litter that would remain on soil surface gets actually incorporated in the soil. And because that promotes the microbial uh, necromass foundation, as we already explained, and also this occlusion of organic matter have set an also positive effect on carbon storage. So in long run, in several decades, this might even promote uh, carbon storage. So this is basically uh, just to show you that in this worm cast, which is here, there is this tiny pieces of organic matter, which you don't see in soil aggregate, which was formed by other processes and this results in much larger carbon storage in this type of aggregates. And more importantly, more carbon stored in these tiny pieces, which then can promote you know, accumulation or growth of microbial biomass on the clay minerals around these pieces. And this can promote actually formation of microbial necromass and eventually a carbon storage. And uh, we already show that this is not happening at the very beginning when the soil have no recent organic carbon because uh, Professor Bonkowski already explained the stechiometric reason for that. And I would have some other reasons that might support it. And we can illustrate that on this example when we have this post mining soils over here and we add the litter, and we add the litter by two different, three different ways. We put the litter on soil surface, we mix the fragmented litter into the soil, and we uh, put the litter on soil surface, and we have two earthworms who mix it for us in each bottle. And when the earthworms consume all the litter, we add some more litter they can mix, so, and we did that several times. So basically during this first addition, uh, the earthworm showed the highest respiration. So they have a higher slow loss of added carbon. By other words, the sequestration of carbon was slower. However, and the fastest sequestration was actually in this treatment, which is the mixed in soil, yes? Yeah? So, the tillage might initially, for example, fast, uh, cost fast accumulation of carbon, but this gets saturated very quickly. And uh, after one year, when we added carbon, we actually see the worm treatment store most carbon. Yeah. So when the, we mix the soil mechanically and when we mix it by worm, there is initial lack, but long term, the earthworms actually promote more carbon storage. They more effectively promote this microbial necromass formation and storage of carbon in that. This is the picture you already see. So basically, uh, at the beginning, this there is some barrier because of microbial stechiometry, which actually slow down this carbon accumulation, this formation of microbial necromass. And on the larger scale, these, uh, these necromass formation also depends on the formation of soil aggregate and on incorporation of this tiny organic matter pieces, this particulate organic carbon into the aggregates. And certainly, once some carbon get accumulated, uh, dissolved organic carbon amount increase, that can also promote aggregation. So there is a lot of uh, positive feedback mechanisms 
which actually promote aggregation, promote suitable environment in which this necromask can be stored. And that's actually the reason for this very fast carbon storage and initial stages of post mining sites development. So if we, uh, this is results, how we can support that? We can support that by choosing of suitable trees. And this is actually a meta-analysis in which we found different examples when the people plant several species of tree together in one place. This is called common garden experiment. And we actually found several common garden experiment, which was established in soil of different ages. So in very young soil, in post mining heap, in former agriculture land and in forest land. And it was in different pH and different texture. And we actually, there was different species planted in the, each of these common garden experiment. There was seven species or more. And there was always several broadleaf and several conifers. So what we actually did, we make average from all broadleaf and all conifer. And we were actually asking in which condition the conifer prefer better, which is this gray area, and in which condition the broadleaf uh, prefer better. And we actually see in a heap, the broadleaf store more carbon, while in this old soil, particularly in forest soil, the conifer stores more carbon. That makes sense because conifer litter is hardly to decompose. And basically this mature soil are already somewhere here. <clears throat> so most of this storage actually happened on forest floor <clears throat> or by particulate organic matter, which leach down from soil surface from forest floor to the soil. Yeah. And the broadleaves actually also do better in you know alkaline soil or neutral soil and in a clay soil, which again supports the theory that they might support aggregate formation and formation of microbial necromass that can be bonded to uh, clay particles. Yeah. Uh, this is basically the same uh, meta-analysis, but instead of speaking about three species, we actually plot down here CN of the litter of these particular species. And we can actually see that in young soil in the heap, uh, there is clear correlation between CN ratio. So the lower is CN ratio, particularly for knife fixers, it's very high carbon storage. Uh, this, this carbon storage is standardized for each study. So these are not tons per hectare, but this is like above average, below average for each study. The study was different. And the same for pH. So if you have alkaline pH, the same trend, you know, the lower pH to higher storage. And the same for clay soil. So the lower uh, CN ratio, the higher storage for clay soil, but not such effect occur in sandy soil. And that's because, you know, uh, there's not really so much clay minerals to bound microbial necromass on that. So these mechanisms might not apply there. And so I already mentioned that at the beginning, it's actually good to plant a broadleaf trees, but later on in mature soil, it's actually uh, conifers are doing better. And uh, we can see that also on this graph from another meta-analysis when we actually see that I already show this graph, once the post-mining site ages, the rate of carbon acc accumulation decrease. So that's a general trend. But if we look on individual type of vegetation separately, we actually see that in conifers, this uh, is, is, uh, this, this correlation tend to be rather, you know, positive or the pattern is more complex. So it's like uh, uh, unimodal 
shape, while in broad leaves, uh, in deciduous trees, you see quite clear the increase. So in conifers at the beginning, the storage might not be so fast, or might increase with the time and vice versa. So if we just describe these mechanisms of carbon storage, so we can actually uh, we can actually see, so this arrow should actually go somewhere here, that at the beginning, we have this microbial stoichiometry limitation, what about uh, Professor Bonkowski was speaking, then we have this many positive feedbacks, which basically means that more carbon gets stored even faster, this is storing, and this counts this fast increase in few decades after uh, you know, this new substrate become available. Then uh, the soil gets to saturation as concerned of clay content and some more carbon in forest soil can accumulate in this unprotected carbon, particulate organic carbon in uh, forest floor. This certainly also depends on climate. So basically in this meta-analysis, when we look on different mining sites, we actually found that the conifer perform better in colder environment, while grasses perform better in warmer environment and broad leaves are somewhere in between them and they are generally the best. So basically if we transfer this to some practical recommendations, we can say, that uh, in, in taiga zone, it's actually good to plant conifers in broadleaf forest zone, in temperate forest zone, it's good to plant broadleaves. And once you move to subtropics, you know, in the uh, steppe zone or in savanna, it's actually good to focus on grassland to achieve the maximum carbon storage. This is again a picture I already shows on this climatic gradients across US. And you already see, you know, how these kind of sequences looks like. And they contain either forest or uh, prairie. And this is what I want to say that in the forest, you see very intensive activity of soil fauna to forming of these aggregates and there will be initial fast carbon storage bound to these aggregates. And the same is true for, for tall grass prairie, but you don't see anything like that in Wyoming when just this particulate organic carbon is mixed to the mineral soil. The soil is very sandy, so there is not so much. The saturation is reached very quickly. There is not so much you know, this, this bounding of microbial microbials to, uh, to clay particles. So basically what I was just showing for this, for this climatic gradient, for this uh, temporal gradient is also affected by texture gradient, but it's also affected by uh, climatic gradient, yeah? Uh, okay. I was, I was quite fast. Okay, so this is this is all, and I am uh, I'm open for question. Okay, so there are any question? Uh, professor, uh, see, this is directly proportional to the clay content, uh, carbon accumulation or carbon storage, particularly the microbial cells are occluded with the clay particles. So can you uh, comment on the subsurface soil? Because in agriculture soil, uh, there's a preferential accumulation of clay in the subsurface due to infiltration and uh, fine particles are moving down. 
So in mine spoil, uh, what we can expect of uh, expect on carbon sequestration or carbon storage in the subsurface in the light of clay content? Well, certainly this subsurface, as you said, is a more clay content and it's also less carbon content. So for example, there is studies of German colleagues showing that if you have soil which is heavily eroded and you basically uh, remove, you know, erosion wash out this uh, topsoil and uh, the B horizon is exposed, then actually carbon storage in this B horizon is much faster than in A horizon because the soil is not saturated and because there is high clay content. Yeah. So, but basically this uh, storage in subsoil is, is limited by amount of carbon which gets there, okay? So if the carbon gets there, potential is high. But mm -hmm. if you have carbon coming to soil surface, then basically depth of bioturbation or depth of mixing by tillage determine to which depth your carbon is coming and which depth can actually store the carbon. Surprisingly, there is not so much done on this driver which drive the depth of storage and cell formation. So this is quite obvious theoretical concept, but we don't really understand the driving principles so much, I would say. But uh, the roots can read some of the subsurface. Absolutely, yeah. And it's actually known that around the roots, they might be quite high storage in subsurface. Okay, okay. Uh, the other question is, uh, it's for Michael. He said the, uh, it's basically the humus is microbial cell wall occluded with the clay. So, but we read it's a, a humus is a kind of a transformed lignin type of materials. Yeah, yeah. So, this is actually kind of um, shifting in the concept. Mm -hmm. Like when I went to school, we actually learned that most organic matter is stored in the form of humic substances. Yeah. Which is this highly, uh, highly, you know, lignin derived, highly uh, phenolic rich substances. Yeah. And nowadays, the people say the most important actually is these lignin, uh, this uh, microbial uh, cell wall, microbial cell wall, which are mostly aliphatic. And actually, aliphatic. Okay. Uh, I don't see this is completely exclusive. Yeah. I would say because now there was some people from this humus, I would say humus part of scientific community who actually try to preparate this humine, which we actually expect would be highly aromatic. And yeah. it actually appeared this humine looks very much like kerogen of first type. So it's a highly aliphatic. It's apparently uh, originating from cell walls. So this is what these guys speaking about, like microbial necromas. And certainly, once this is saturated, uh, particularly in the you know, coniferous forest or in the species that produce hardly decomposable litter, this polycondensation of phenolic substances and protein can also cause, you know, fixing of organic matter uh, chemically, and this can be hardly decomposable. It's probably a slower process than this fast initial increase, but can be responsible for this slow increase over millennia in forest floor and surface of forest A horizon. So I wouldn't say that, you know, this shift in my opinion, get a little bit too far. I'm not really a fan of the idea that the humus doesn't exist at all, but apparently it might have a lower uh, importance in carbon storage than we thought, you know, 30 years ago. Okay. So what I feel is both the process are undergoing because the plant litters, after decomposition, it is losing the cellulose and hemicellulose. 
the lignin part of the plant litters can go inside the soil and stay in the soil for long years. Yeah, but also we did we did quite a lot of uh, we did quite a lot of studies about that. And even when the lignin breaks to phenols and you know individual phenols, mm -hmm. they might actually precipitate with proteins and they might fix themselves on clay minerals. And that way they might become hardly accessible to microbial breakdown and they can stay conserved yeah. for a very long time. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank you. So I would say this this microbial necromass is is this early part and oh no. Hello, uh, uh, Dej to, vyspedovávodky, nebo to hoď tady ke mně, já jsem ředitelně v sobě a na sobě. Jo, a nebo ke mně do laborky to hoď a já z toho voda odnesu. Asi bude na obědě. Tak to, dej to mý laborky, jestli je tam bude v říjnu. Tak jo, díky. No, tak to tam hoď. Ne, já jsem teď ředitelně na sobě, proč mám net meeting. Díky, ahoj. Sorry, that's what's coming. Yeah, mm, this uh, aliphatic carbon of microbial origin, if once it is exposed, if there is no clay particle, it can be easily mineralized or uh, it's difficult to mineralize? I think so. Yeah, you see, there is, uh, uh, the, the people believe so, yeah, that this bonding to clay makes it actually difficult to utilized. What I understand is microbial cell wall is much fragile than plant cell wall. I don't know, I may be wrong. Yeah, the many people who make decomposition experiments, they say they are actually much more resistant to decomposition than the plant cell walls. Okay, resistant but, than the plant cell wall. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's okay. Thank you. So there are some other questions. Yes, uh, I have a little bit of, uh, uh, to my own knowledge. Now in uh, tropical climate like India, uh, when there is a um, high temperature in peak summer, say for example, we can get um, uh, greater than 40, 42, 43, 44 degree centigrade. That time, uh, because I have not seen many earthworms uh, in uh, any reclaimed site that carefully. Now, I want to know whether that high temperature, uh, whether earthworm will be uh, bound, uh, will, will, uh, will hide inside a litter or they will die. That is the question. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't you know, look at that in India, but uh, I actually have seen some sites in the Hradun and if it's a suitable part of year, I see quite a lot of soil fauna, including earthworms. So I expect they actually survive this dry period of the year deep in the soil and they may be active just seasonally. But we did some work, for example, in Papua New Guinea and there the Animal perturbation is actually a very important part of carbon uh, cycle and is a substantial part of carbon from later layer is incorporated. So, so I believe they might be important also in tropical soils. And moreover, in dry season, in tropical soils, uh, the termites would be uh, crucial. Because many high reclaimed site, we have lots of ants and termites population, very yeah. common. So termites would be really important in that. I would, I would bet. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Okay, so there was some more question. Pavel, yeah. Uh, yes, Professor, I have a question. Uh, may I ask you for some clarification because on uh, one of the picture you showed that uh, earthworms increase uh, soil organic carbon content due to the <clears throat> increasing microbial uh, activity 
but then you said also that uh, the sites with the higher abundance of earthworms uh, mm, results in uh, less carbon sequestration. No, uh, I just say that over time, when we have this experiment, when we put overburden, pure overburden, yeah, just very fresh. And when we put earthworms into this, at the beginning, they do not promote any carbon storage. Yeah? At the very beginning, like first 20 okay. days, first 30 days. But yeah, after that, that, they start to promote carbon storage. So that's very uh, fit to the idea which Professor Bunkowski actually said, when the soil has no recent carbon, most of this added carbon, you add it intensively, but it's actually used for microbial uh, to feed, yeah? So they, they, they respire most of it and less of it, they turn to microbial biomass. And once the carbon in soil reach certain threshold, you actually increasing. And this is magnified by earthworm. Okay, Does it I make understand sense? it now. Does yes. it make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thank it's you. Basically the same what the Professor Bonkowski say, I'm just saying that Erso magnify this process. So in this uh, initial stage, when the soil is kind of uh, non-saturated, not non-saturated, but there is nothing to eat for microbes, you put more carbon and they eat it. And then when it's, uh, after this, uh, for us, it's not 1% because we have this fossil carbon. This fossil carbon is not so much used by microbes, yeah? So it makes it a little bit more complicated. But, but the principle is the same, yeah? So when there is some amount of carbon reached, so microbes can sustain their own metabolism, then they produce more necromants. And the earthworms can actually promote both of these processes. Okay, so uh, it seems that uh, maybe not everything, but a lot of things is de de depends on the air forms abundance and uh, the, its biomass in the soil. Yes. And did you provide or do you know any results from the uh, post mining sites, the, the, the result, results about the correlation between uh, soil pH, I mean, actually alkanity uh, yeah. with the earthworm, earthworm abundance, because I, I know the, 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 the study. So basically, of... basically uh, if, you, uh, if you have, uh, the pH is important. So the earthworm density is, uh, uh, so to say, positively correlated with pH. So if you have highly acidic soil, there is no earthworms. And if you have slightly acidic neutral or alkaline soil, there is more earthworms in mining sites. And it's also correlated with the litter quality, yeah? So if you have litter, which lower CN ratio, you typically have more earthworms and vice versa. And these two factors like goes together, yeah? So, if you have highly alkaline soil, you might have some worms even in high CN later. But if you have highly acidic soil, uh, you wouldn't have uh, all, no or very few even under alder later. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes uh... Uh, of course, it it makes sense. Uh, actually, I was wondering if there are some uh, studies about uh, sycamore maple leaves because, uh, as far as I know, they contain quite a relatively uh, yeah. high I amount not, of calcium, and they yeah, yeah. promote. I I do not remember any study about maple. We. I, I know study about different other different tree species looking on earthworms from many of these common garden experiments. There was earthworm studied, 
but I do not recall if some of them contain maple, actually. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Okay, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Yes. Good Hello. Afternoon. Hello, sir. Yeah, I, I'm hearing you. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, sir, regarding your, your question of earthworm, you know, sir, have you conducted any kind of research work uh, on uh, earthworm in between exotic and native woody plant species? earthworm diversity and functions? Yeah, there is certainly relationships between plants and earthworms. Uh, mm -hmm. as, I, as I said, you know, if you have more uh, quality litter, mm -hmm. you, have, you have more earthworms and uh, you have also typically higher diversity. If you have... Okay. Uh, if you have low uh, high CN ratio, you typically have only a PGX species. Uh, yeah. So there is ah, relationships, uh, but most of these studies, to be honest, was done in temperate zone. So uh, I'm not really sure how much they are transferable to tropics. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Another, what is the favorable temperature range for earthworm population? Is 25 to 30 degrees centigrade? I would say, you know, I really, I really do not have any exact data to support that. Okay, sir. But I would say it really depends on species, you know. For temperate yeah, earthworm, it will be around 50 degrees, but I'm pretty sure it can be much more for some tropical species, but Mm -hmm. I'm not really recall any hard data from top of my head. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Actually, sir, Professor Mathi asked about uh, the temperature in dry deciduous in tropical uh, in tropical region. The temperature uh, because it's forty degrees centigrade. I can give in information because uh, earthworm any other kind of funnel diversity may survive up to 30, 35 degrees centigrade. More than so, temperature, it declining of funnel diversity. Yeah, I actually hmm. also know it's also differ between microhabitats. So when we do our yeah, 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 correct, in, sir, correct. This PNG in the rainforest yeah, yeah. temperature is typically much lower than, for example, if you make field. Mm -hmm. pH is also a very important factor. For sure. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you for the questions. Thank you for your attention. And we will make a break now till 1 p.m. Central European time. And then we'll be followed by Dr. Tropek, who will tell us about potential post mining sites for nature protection and conservation of rare species. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, see you then.
Hello, everybody. I'm just uh, uh, testing my audio and video. Can, can you hear me? Jana, can you put down the presentation? Good. Hello, everybody. Jana has to go to the vaccination oh, yeah. so, center. So, so I'm I, here. I sorry, I, I didn't realize you had changed. Yes. So, never mind. <laughs> you did it very nicely. So, Robert, you can start here. Yeah? Uh, I think there is still like seven minutes, right? Yeah, but you want you say you want to try to share it. Aha, uh -huh, all right, okay, I can, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, Just to test it. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. There should be green bottom on the... Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm yeah. just testing it, so... Good, we see it. And you can put it in presentation mode, mm -hmm. maybe. Can you see it now, the presentation mode? No, now, yes. yeah, now, now we see Perfect. it. All right. You can switch one slide so we see it's moving because this is sometimes also a problem. Perfect. Yep. Perfect. Good. 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 So I'm, I might introduce you by a few words and I might not be able to stay to the very end. So I might just say a few words about tomorrow. And so we will we will wait about six minutes and I will introduce you and then we can start. Thank you for, thank you for joining us anyway.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you after a break, which you might use for, well, uh, any kind of dish appropriate to your time zone, I would say. And I would like to uh, introduce uh, Robert Tropek, who is a uh, uh, chairman of uh, Czech Society for Ecology by other means, and who will actually speak to us about conservation potential of post-industrial sites, because as we already mentioned, some of these post-industrial sites, including post-mining sites, are have a great value for uh, nature protection as a habitat for rare and endangered species. I might uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, need to leave before, before end of the talk. So I hope Robert would be able to handle his own question or the question going to, to him to, to, uh, to kind of uh, manage that. And uh, tomorrow morning, uh, we will meet at 11 a.m. Central European time and then Bill, there will be Dr. Hendrikova from Czech University of Life Sciences will be speaking about landscape aspect of uh, mining sites. So with that, I would like to uh, introduce the Robert Topek and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jan, for invitation and for introduction. Uh, I will just say a few more words about myself. Uh, I'm actually coming from the very industrial part of our uh, country. Uh, actually, I was born just uh, five kilometers from this uh, like quite ugly uh, place, and I grew up uh, just uh, just just nearby that. So I have very personal experience uh, with uh, these uh, kind of sites, and uh, I'm actually uh, researching diversity there uh, since uh, 2003 or four. Uh, so it's also quite a longer time, and uh, I'm like uh, more and more surprised. Uh, how sometimes uh, these um, like uh, often uh, ugly and dark sites uh, can be also like the real refugees of uh, biodiversity. And I will try to share uh, some of my experience or experience from uh, other studies uh, from these sites and to show you that uh, like uh, industry and uh, like artificial industrial sites are not only destroying our landscape, uh, but they are also offering some second chance uh, to some uh, species which are vanishing from our landscape. Uh, I'm actually uh, entomologist, so quite a lot of examples uh, will be about uh, insects. Uh, but uh, as you will see, and as I'm pretty sure that uh, you can have your personal experience, uh, quite some of these principles uh, can be generalized to uh, other groups as well. So basically, Oh, why it's not working at this moment. Yeah, okay. So I will uh, basically, the, the uh, lecture will be structured uh, to uh, three main parts. The first will be very short and I will basically just uh, very briefly introduce uh, the state of European nature. Like uh, my lecture is really centered uh, to Europe and maybe uh, mainly to Central Europe. Uh, then uh, I will actually introduce uh, how uh, helpful uh, some sites uh, can be to protect uh, or support uh, these vanishing species. And then the last part, uh, uh, I will be speaking about some uh, restoration management and restoration tools and their effect on, uh, these, uh, on this diversity uh, potential. So first, the rhetorical question, how is our nature? Uh, like uh, we all know that uh, our nature is not in the best shape, but uh, if you go to insects, like a uh, quite diverse and uh, heterogeneous uh, group of uh, uh, organisms, uh, we can actually uh, uh, we can end up uh, in the uh, in the situation that is maybe even worse than uh, many of us uh, could expect. Like uh, these are just uh, summaries summaries. Uh, from uh, national red list, uh, so basically uh, some evaluation uh, of um, population declines of uh, individual uh, species, uh, in this case uh, of butterflies and spiders, which are actually the groups uh, uh, with uh, which uh, I have the best experience. And uh, we can actually see that uh, everything that is not green uh, is somehow threatened, more or less. So basically more than half of our species uh, are uh, declining uh, more or less. And like this pattern is similar uh, to butterflies and spiders, which are actually, uh, of course, spiders are not insects. Uh, I, I hope that this is clear, but uh, there are arthropods uh, with a similar uh, ecology and similar diversity. So I'm often uh, using them as an example as well. 
And uh, what is the worst are actually uh, these uh, uh, black and uh, bright red parts, uh, which actually visualize uh, species which are already uh, regionally extinct. So uh, they completely uh, vanished uh, from the disappeared from uh, our country or uh, which are critical and endangered. Yeah, in the insects or spiders, it typically means that uh, these species have uh, one, on, uh, one or two last populations in the entire country and these populations are declining and they are threatened. So uh, without any action, this is just a matter of time uh, when, they will have, when they will move uh, to the uh, black uh, uh, part as well. So more or less uh, one quarter uh, of uh, our uh, insect diversity, if you actually uh, approximate it to the other groups of insects as well, uh, something like uh, one quarter of our diversity of insects is missing. Uh, it's actually similar uh, across uh, Europe. Uh, you can see it. Uh, you can see it uh, here on this, uh, like a uh, um, whole European uh, analysis of the red list of butterflies, and you can actually see that, especially uh, in this uh, belt of the, like a um, let's say central belt, uh, belt of Europe, uh, from UK through the Central Europe up to the Eastern Europe, the situation is really uh, not good. Yeah? More red color uh, means that uh, uh, like uh, more species are either extinct or critically endangered or just uh, declining. And you can see that there is something happening uh, with our biodiversity. And it's always uh, good to check like uh, what's happening and why it is happening. Uh, so here are some uh, like uh, uh, preliminary analysis of the uh, check red lists of uh, butterflies and spiders uh, just to see uh, species of uh, what uh, habitat associations are actually those uh, which are uh, in decline. So here are like distributional trend, uh, which basically means, uh, uh, which basically mean how the entire uh, distribution occurrence of individual species in our country has either uh, declined or uh, uh, raised. And you can actually see that in general, uh, the situation is uh, pretty pessimistic and most of the uh, habitat uh, specialists uh, actually uh, declined, except uh, those species which are somehow generalized in their uh, habitat needs. So basically whatever uh, is, uh, whatever is uh, specialized to any kind of habitat uh, has been declining uh, like uh, in, in uh, uh, sometimes uh, between uh, uh, this uh, century and the previous century. And uh, it's also useful to check what is the most threatened, what is uh, the most declining. And these are uh, species of really special habitats, just like uh, peat box. Yeah, these are uh, pretty uh, declining, uh, but also species uh, which are um, associated to something which used to be here quite common and uh, which is vanishing uh, somehow hiddenly uh, so, and uh, it cannot be uh, or potentially it is not so apparent uh, just like a decline of peat box. And these are species of some dry, warm, early successional habitats or dry and warm uh, mid-successional habitats. So either some uh, early successional grasslands, uh, step-like grasslands, and uh, like uh, other early successional habitats, or some uh, open and semi-open uh, shrublands. Yeah, as you can see, we are speaking about uh, uh, such a specialist. And for spiders, we actually don't have uh, so detailed information about the uh, habitat associations of individual species, but we can uh, split them at least to specialist to open habitats and to other habitats. And you can see that among the uh, regional extinct and critically endangered and the other threatened categories of the red list, uh, always uh, the specialists for open habitats are prevailing and the only group uh, there, uh, the other habitats are actually prevailing, or species of the other habitats are prevailing, are these uh, so-called ecologically uh, stable uh, species. Yeah. So we can see that uh, something is happening and it's very commonly uh, like a negatively uh, related to like uh, open habitats in both butterflies and uh, spiders. And it can be uh, generalized for other uh, insects as well. And basically this situation is not so unique uh, for uh, our country or Central Europe only. Uh, here are just two examples, but there are like uh, numerous uh, studies uh, from across uh, basically the entire uh, whole, Arctic, uh, whole Arctic region. 
And basically, this is a already quite a famous and a classical uh, study by Jeremy Thomas, which is actually the first uh, study uh, when uh, some researchers put uh, together uh, like a uh, habitat associations of individual species and their status in the red list. And uh, basically, this was done on British uh, beetles. And uh, you can see that a big part of uh, these uh, threatened species, like a uh, you can see that this is the highest uh, bar and um, these uh, species uh, are actually uh, related to the earliest uh, stages of succession with a lot of bare substrate. Uh, these are typically uh, disturbed habitats and so on. And it can be surprising that uh, these uh, species uh, belong among the uh, most uh, uh, endangered uh, uh, group. Of, uh, of, of beetles. And uh, similarly, uh, this is uh, some uh, study uh, from the Mediterranean, from uh, Greece, and it's basically uh, uh, studying uh, diversity of threatened or red listed species of butterflies uh, in related to succession on the uh, abandoned uh, pastures uh, and grazelands. And you can basically see that uh, more closed the canopy of shrubs and trees is. Uh, less uh, red listed species of butterflies, you can find it. So again, like a uh, species of uh, grasslands and other open habitats are uh, much more threatened than the species of uh, forests. Yeah? So basically the take home message from the beginning is that uh, uh, species of young habitats are definitely endangered uh, in Europe and uh, uh, they should be somehow prioritized uh, in the nature conservation. Uh, and uh, just uh, leaving uh, for a while insects uh, or species actually uh, and go to habitats. I'm, um, I, I'm very uh, happy always uh, to use uh, natural sands, uh, open sands uh, like sand dunes or some uh, uh, riverine uh, beds and so on as the example of vanishing uh, open habitats. Uh, like uh, these are definitely disturbance uh, dependent uh, habitats. They were created uh, by, uh, by intensive disturbance, uh, by the river and dynamics, uh, by fires, uh, and then they were maintained uh, by, uh, again, fires and uh, dry stress and so on, uh, together uh, with uh, intensive grazing uh, by, uh, by mega herbivores. And basically, uh, in the already a few centuries ago, uh, we have uh, suppressed uh, these uh, natural disturbances, like uh, we somehow uh, regulated all our rivers to basically avoid flooding, because of course we don't want to have floodings in our landscapes. Uh, like, uh, we are suppressing or uh, fires independently if they are artificial or natural. Uh, we basically erased all the natural mega herbivores from the landscapes and we usually don't uh, have uh, cattle in these uh, non-productive uh, habitats. Uh, plus, actually, uh, there was a very intensive afforestation of these bare lands, which is useless for anything already a few centuries ago. So basically, currently, we have only a few small remnants which are fully dependent on our activities. Uh, this is the example of some kind of uh, model landscapes uh, along the, the Elbe River. Uh, here in the like uh, northern part of our country, and all the black polygons are basically the natural uh, sand dunes, drift sand dunes, uh, which has always been a uh, kind of a rare uh, habitat in Central Europe, only along the large rivers, uh, rivers. But as you can see, it was not so rare and definitely uh, there was a good opportunity for species to get specialized uh, and uh, very well adapted for these uh, extreme conditions. And basically, uh, as I said, uh, these are already like previous uh, uh, areas of uh, drifts and dunes, basically almost everything of that completely disappeared. And what has remained are only these uh, yellow dots, uh, which are the remaining uh, open uh, sand uh, habitats uh, in this uh, entire landscape uh, of like uh, several uh, hundreds of square kilometers. And uh, none of them is really large. Uh, they are usually uh, of the size of the standard lecture room or even smaller. So basically, uh, they became to be like, uh, let's say, almost disappeared uh, habitats. Uh, and currently, uh, their communities are really uh, co considered as uh, one of the most uh, critically endangered uh, uh, 
communities or habitats in Central Europe. Uh, like as I said, uh, species are really well adapted uh, to uh, to uh, those habitats because they are extreme. They are very strongly desiccative. Uh, they are very uh, very sensitive uh, to any disturbances because they are created and maintained by disturbances. And basically, the species which are uh, really strongly adapted uh, to these uh, conditions. They are not able to live anywhere else uh, in the common landscape, especially because uh, they are commonly overcompeted uh, by a stronger species. And basically, just two examples. Uh, of uh, butterflies, uh, which were uh, among these so-called somophilous species, which means that they were uh, very uh, strongly adapted uh, to these uh, open sands. And uh, like one of them has actually just the edge of its distribution. It's more like Mediterranean on Pannonian species, but it occurred in our country. All these populations are already extinct. And uh, this other species, which was a bit more widespread, especially along the uh, large rivers, and uh, it got completely extinct in our country uh, as well. And uh, uh, like uh, solitary bees, uh, they are uh, very typical uh, for these uh, sandy uh, bare land uh, habitats. Uh, they are also important pollinators, bringing a lot of uh, ecosystem services and so on. And uh, they use uh, these uh, bare sands for their nesting and for their uh, other uh, uh, life uh, needs. And basically, like uh, other like species of other habitats of solitary bees are commonly uh, endangered in Europe as well. But if we compare the proportion of uh, either extinct or critically endangered, which means that they have like one or more, uh, one or two uh, last populations in the entire country, uh, we will see that the proportion uh, of the uh, lost uh, or almost lost diversity among the drift sand specialists is almost double. So this is also a very good indicator that something wrong has happened uh, with uh, this uh, special habitats. Uh, the problem is uh, not only uh, with natural sense, the problem uh, we can uh, we can see uh, in uh, other open habitats as well. Uh, this is a very nice uh, picture from uh, the south uh, eastern corner of our country. Uh, this is a national park uh, called uh, Podiyi, and it basically consists of uh, these uh, very nice uh, riverine uh, gorge and valleys. Uh, uh, like uh, in the warmest uh, corner of our country. It was typical by this uh, mosaic of open and semi-open habitats with a lot of habitat specialists from various groups. Uh, one of the species richest uh, uh, area in the entire Europe. And uh, basically, even though this is national park and uh, we, should, uh, we should conserve uh, our diversity there, we should protect it. Uh, this is how it uh, looks in many uh, of its parts uh, today. It basically, because of uh, uh, removing, suppressing of uh, disturbances, uh, it has overgrown uh, by uh, forests uh, and shrubs and the habitats has closed. And uh, uh, most of uh, this uh, really uh, unique diversity has been either already lost or uh, is somehow suppressed and the populations are in very strong uh, decline. And uh, basically, uh, so far, I have been talking uh, mainly about uh, like, a, let's say, special habitats uh, or uh, some uh, not so common species. But uh, it has been shown, uh, it has been uh, evidenced repeatedly, especially in the past few years, that even the common species uh, from common landscapes are actually disappearing. And I will not be uh, boring you by uh, many graphs showing the insect decline, because I strongly believe uh, you have seen them even in the common media in the past years uh, repeatedly. But I will, uh, I will speak about uh, this uh, uh, special butterfly. Its name is actually uh, Hazara Briseis, uh, uh, hermit in English. And uh, it, it used to be common, like all these gray dots, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, 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 original distribution in our country. And you can see that it was almost everywhere. Yeah, it was in all lowlands. It was even in uh, some uh, midlands, uh, basically everywhere, because this is species uh, which is uh, really uh, specialized uh, for uh, grazelands, yeah, for pastures uh, like which are not so uh, not so intensive, uh, uh, because. Uh, it's uh, um, caterpillars are actually developing in the disturbed uh, tarps of uh, uh, grasses. Yeah? 
And uh, the result after uh, like uh, changes in the agriculture is that uh, this species got extinct almost everywhere in our, in our country. And the last remaining population are these last uh, black dots in the only, uh, only locality in the one uh, system of dry hills uh, in otherwise uh, agricultural uh, land. And this is a good example of a previously very common species which is at the edge of its uh, extinction. So we can see that even the common species uh, uh, have been disappearing or, or already almost uh, disappear. And this is because like uh, uh, there has been uh, like a very, uh, uh, very apparent uh, uh, change in the uh, like a landscape uh, structure with the successional overgrowing and the closures of uh, naturally opened habitats and from such kind of mosaic like like semi natural uh, landscape with many very nice uh, habitats uh, our country looks uh, really like a like a intensively agricultural uh, larger uh, areas of uh, crop fields or intensive pastures or intensive meadows and uh, like a closed uh, forest and almost nothing in between. So all these species which are using this uh, semi-open habitat, uh, semi-open landscape with the uh, habitat mosaic uh, have basically almost nowhere to live here except these uh, very restricted uh, forest uh, edges or some edges uh, among the fields. Uh, one example is this uh, historical castle on the dry hill. This is how it looked like something like a one hour, uh, one, 100 years ago. Uh, it, really, it really hosted uh, richer communities of insects and also many orchid species and so on. Nowadays, it, look like, it looks like uh, this. It's overgrown by forest and basically most of the uh, precious species uh, has uh, disappeared already. Yeah. Uh, and how are actually the post-industrial sites uh, related uh, to this? Uh, of course, uh, I'm absolutely aware that uh, with industry, many habitats are actually disappearing, many habitats are polluted, there are many negative ways. But on the other hand, uh, like, a, um, like mining and under in some other industrial uh, activities uh, can be actually creating uh, some secondary habitats, some artificial habitats, and some of them uh, can be actually uh, secondary refugees for some of the species I have been just talking about. Uh, I have again two examples of butterflies. I actually hope that uh, butterflies are not boring for you. Uh, they are very good indicators of uh, like a diversity. So I like to use them and also our knowledge about them is really exceptional. Uh, so uh, they are there. Uh, this is uh, Hipparchia semele. Uh, I think it's called ringlet in English, but I'm not 100% sure, sorry, but it's Hipparchia semele. And this is another, uh, another example of Saturn butterfly, uh, who, uh, what used to be uh, quite common in our landscape. Yeah, you can see these are all historic records, so they are definitely not uh, uh, complete, but you, you could have find it in uh, like uh, basically all regions of our country, except uh, the highest mountains. Uh, in the past decades, it has disappeared from almost everywhere, again, because of uh, suppression or abandonment of uh, grazing uh, and the uh, overgrowing of its nature sorry, of its natural habitat. And uh, just a few years ago, uh, we used to have the last uh, three uh, populations in our country. Uh, and actually all of them, they're related to post-industrial lands landscape. The smallest one uh, was here close to Příbram, uh, which is uh, the historical uh, region of mining of uranium. And there are still uh, like a huge, uh, dumps uh, of the screes and actually this butterfly uh, used to be uh, reproducing on the slopes of these uh, screes uh, dumps. Unfortunately, uh, it has got just very recently uh, extinct in uh, this, uh, uh, in this uh, area. Uh, the second, uh, this time quite large population is just uh, in Prague and uh, in the uh, southwestern uh, outskirts of Prague. And uh, here, uh, the species is actually uh, surviving and very efficiently reproducing uh, in 
two types of habitats. One is actually uh, natural reserves of the remnants of a step like grasslands, very often trampled intensively by tourists, because again, it's a uh, uh, caterpillars really need to disturb, uh, disturb the tufts of uh, grasses. And the second is actually uh, these uh, limestone quarries, uh, abundant limestone quarries, but sometimes even the uh, still uh, active limestone quarries, because uh, they are created with these like a uh, uh, fine grained uh, mosaics of uh, like a uh, secondary, but uh, by its uh, uh, community composition, semi-natural uh, um, habitats. And uh, this is exactly what this species uh, means. And without that, uh, we uh, strongly doubt that it would uh, have survived uh, in the uh, last um, small uh, pieces of the protected uh, uh, natural uh, grassland. And the uh, trot uh, population of uh, this species uh, has been occurring uh, in the very strongly industrial uh, region of the northwestern uh, Bohemia in this part. And basically it was, uh, it used to be very enigmatic population because it was always uh, found uh, just in single specimens. And uh, uh, we had no idea where this is coming from uh, until uh, like uh, we have found that uh, it's a huge population is actually surviving in the fly ash deposit. Uh, so it means in the um, full, uh, like completely industrial uh, habitat, uh, basically big pile of uh, waste after uh, coal combustion. And basically all the, all the uh, individual specimens, which we uh, used to be finding in the common landscape, uh, they're just uh, like uh, basically uh, uh, reproduced uh, in this uh, single locality. Uh, and the second example is this uh, very, uh, very emblematic uh, species, uh, uh, Parnassus Apollo or Apollo butterfly, uh, which uh, used to uh, used to live in our country already, I don't know, 130 years ago uh, in its uh, colder parts, uh, like usually in some uh, bordering mountains and so on. Uh, it requires very uh, large uh, screes uh, with a bare uh, substrate uh, where uh, it can survive only because it needs really large uh, populations and uh, its specimens has really uh, a large uh, home ranges and so on. It got extinct 130 years ago, uh, plus minus. It got completely extinct from our country. Uh, and actually it uh, declined in uh, many European countries as well. Uh, because it's very nice animal, emblematic. Uh, like since that time, uh, there have been like uh, definitely dozens and maybe even hundreds uh, of tries to reintroduce it uh, back. And all of them actually failed, uh, except the, the only uh, current population which is reintroduced, and it was uh, actually reintroduced in the large uh, system of limestone quarries uh, in uh, Moravia, in uh, eastern Moravia. And this is the only uh, area in our current country uh, there, like a, a large uh, open and uh, prevailingly uh, bare substrated uh, habitats uh, occur in our country. It's large enough to uh, harbor even uh, such a, uh, like a picky uh, species. So uh, that's it. Uh, but uh, like uh, these uh, post-industrial sites uh, can be very, very, uh, important refugees on biodiversity, uh, even in the regional scale. Uh, I really like to use uh, the uh, Kladno region. Uh, this is actually a region uh, just uh, at the outskirts of Prague. Uh, Kladno is like a mid-sized uh, town, uh, like uh, not so far from Prague. There is even like uh, the, the public uh, Prague transport going there. Uh, and uh, because, of the, because of its position, it always uh, used to be intensively agricultural area because uh, like a uh, 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 even historically, uh, like uh, there were produced a lot of uh, food uh, for Prague. Plus, uh, it is also the area of uh, one of very few areas in our country of uh, black coal. So it led uh, to like a big, uh, uh, um, like big industrialization of this uh, region already uh, several uh, uh, several um, centuries ago, and uh, as a result. Uh, like uh, this uh, region has been quite strongly 
uh, uh, destroyed. Uh, there are almost uh, no natural or even semi-natural habitats. This is how it looks like. These are really intensive fields, uh, industrial areas, and all these uh, like uh, areas which could seem like a natural forest uh, from the aerial picture. These are basically uh, old uh, dumps uh, after uh, after coal mining. Okay? So basically, there are almost uh, no uh, semi-natural uh, sites. Uh, basically, this is how it looks like. Uh, this, this, this is the intensive uh, agricultural areas, uh, somehow, somehow interrupted, uh, sometimes somehow interrupted uh, by uh, these uh, uh, very, well, let's say, uh, weird uh, hills. And these are not hills, of course. These are uh, big uh, dumps uh, of spoil after mining or after metallurgic industry and so on. And uh, they can offer very interesting uh, habitats. Like this is uh, the largest uh, uh, black hole spoil uh, dump in the area. Uh, this is uh, the spoil after some metallurgic industry. And you can see there is pretty nice, uh, pretty nice uh, naturally looking grasslands. And uh, if you then check uh, the entire region, there are basically several dozens of, uh, uh, of uh, um, the dumps uh, after black coal mining, plus there are a few dumps uh, after uh, metallurgic or uh, ore processing and so on, plus uh, several uh, sand uh, mines, uh, clay mines or stone mines. So this is uh, in this uh, region, uh, these uh, like post-industrial sites are very uh, important uh, parts of the landscape. Uh, and uh, we uh, actually have quite good uh, data for butterfly distribution, both historic and uh, recent uh, from the entire uh, region. Uh, because it's very close to Prague, uh, it also means that uh, quite a lot of entomologists and uh, other uh, natural historians, uh, natural historists uh, from Prague, uh, they uh, used to be uh, going there uh, for their trips and uh, excursions and expeditions. So we have very good uh, data on the historical occurrence of butterflies there. Actually, this region historically uh, hosted uh, 93 species of butterflies from which uh, we, 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 we are absolutely sure that one third uh, already got extinct regionally. So at this moment, uh, we have plus minus 61 uh, known species of butterflies there, which is like a, almost half of a species diversity of butterflies in our country. So this is a pretty high number. Uh, and uh, then uh, during my uh, PhD thesis uh, with my colleagues, uh, we did a very detailed uh, uh, like a um, survey of butterflies on uh, black coal spo spoil dumps. And we have actually realized that from these 61 unknown species, uh, like almost all of them occur uh, in the black coal spoil dumps. And it's also necessary to say that a, a really overwhelming majority of the threatened species and some non-threatened species occur uh, solely uh, on the black coal spoil dumps and nowhere else in the region. So basically, uh, this is the example when these post-industrial sites uh, are the real refugee of diversity in the entire region, uh, which would have been uh, much uh, poorer uh, than with them. Okay? Uh, we also did a uh, service for some uh, study uh, of uh, uh, import, uh, of influence of uh, uh, like a restoration reclamation uh, management uh, in the sites, and uh, it was actually uh, much less extent. Uh, we focused only on several, uh, only on several uh, of these uh, several dozens of uh, spoil uh, dumps. Uh, on the other hand, we focused on many more groups of uh, invertebrates uh, and on plants, yeah, like uh, uh, ten groups of uh, insects and. Uh, uh, and uh, spiders uh, plus plants. And we have actually found that uh, like uh, there are quite a few like threatened species even in these uh, even in these groups, including one species which used to be considered to be extinct in the entire country. It uh, has some secondary population or the population uh, on the secondary habitat. There, uh, the species actually survived the, the changes in our landscape. Uh, one critically endangered species and uh, several uh, other. 
species of the red list. And actually quite a few, uh, like um, much more than 10% of species found uh, in these uh, spoil dumps, uh, they're considered as the specialist uh, for the natural steps, for the undisturbed steps, but uh, they are obviously able uh, to uh, survive even in these like uh, disturbance created uh, industrial habitats, although uh, they are uh, disappearing from the common landscape. So basically the Clatton region diversity is uh, definitely much richer uh, because of uh, industry. Of course, the industry firstly, uh, uh, firstly destroyed a lot of habitats there, but it has happened quite a long time ago and there is now nothing to do about that. But uh, if we uh, somehow restore them wisely, uh, we can uh, use them for uh, like a secondarily uh, import, uh, improvement of, of the di or, or secondary uh, support of the diversity uh, there. And why actually uh, some post-industrial sites uh, can serve as a secondary refugees uh, for vanishing species, mainly because uh, they often offer uh, quite a big uh, diversity of various uh, habitats. And many of them are exactly uh, the habitats uh, which, uh, mm, uh, which I mentioned uh, that uh, uh, are connected uh, to the species which are the most endangered uh, in our part of the world, uh, which are like, a, uh, like initial successional grasslands or step-like grasslands, some dry and warm uh, ruderals, but also some open mosaics of, uh, of roots uh, of like uh, young trees and uh, shrubs uh, mixed uh, with uh, these uh, uh, remnants of grasslands uh, and definitely some screes and uh, bare uh, rocky walls and so on. But also we should not uh, forget on the freshwater the diversity because of course in many industrial sites, uh, there is a problem with the pollution of these uh, uh, freshwaters. But um, for instance, if you, if you mine, if you excavate uh, the um, limestone, just like these uh, pictures, or I don't know, coal and so on, and uh, uh, you don't uh, use uh, chemicals for that, it means that there is a, like a somehow, maybe surprisingly, the waters are much less polluted than in normal landscapes because there are uh, no herbicides, there are no pesticides, there are no insect insecticides and so on. And uh, they are really uh, nutrient poor, which is pretty, uh, which is pretty important uh, because uh, if you add nutrients to water, you basically support only a few uh, very competitive species and they outcompete everything. And last but not, but not least, uh, these, uh, uh, freshwater pools in post-industrial sites. They are very commonly not uh, connected uh, with uh, rivers or large lakes, which means that uh, they are very hard to be colonized by fish, uh, which is actually very beneficial for the diversity of uh, plants, for the diversity of invertebrates and the other groups as well. So this is why uh, some of these uh, sites uh, can be really uh, good uh, for nature protection. Uh, and uh, also it's necessary to say that uh, because of uh, lack of nutrition, like I mean, general lack of nutrition in these sites also means that the natural succession is uh, very slow. In some places it can be blocked for um, at least decades. Uh, and like such early successional habitats are like uh, naturally uh, kept there or maintained there uh, for a long uh, decades, even without any uh, supportive uh, conservation. Uh, management. Uh, just another case, uh, I think I will skip this over, like another study of butterflies in different parts of our country, uh, which uh, found uh, quite uh, like important, uh, both European and national, nationally endangered uh, species of butterflies, uh, which uh, do not occur in other parts of our country. Uh, Another example of our study, just to show you some examples uh, of the um, of the 
endangered and critically uh, endangered species there. Uh, this area is uh, from the Bohemian Karst, uh, which is the limestone uh, area uh, just in the southwest uh, corner of Prague. Uh, so anybody visiting Prague should also visit uh, this uh, Bohemian Karst because it's really, uh, it's really important biodiversity area. And big part of uh, its diversity is at this moment uh, like a surviving in its uh, limestone quarries. And uh, here, uh, in this uh, study, again from my dissertation, uh, we did survey of uh, just a few, uh, uh, just a few uh, limestone quarries, uh, like uh, of uh, several, uh, again, 10 groups of arthropods uh, plus plants. And we found, again, one species of, uh, in this case, leafhopper, which was considered to be regionally extinct in the entire country, uh, two critically endangered species. One of them, as an example, is uh, this uh, uh, grasshopper, Edipoda germanica, uh, which uh, used to be relatively common in our country in the warm areas. But at this moment, it has only two last uh, uh, populations. And both of them are actually living in uh, old uh, abandoned uh, quarries. Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, like uh, another example, uh, this time, uh, these are brown coil uh, spoil heaps. And uh, uh, this study actually uh, focused on freshwater diversity, in this case, on uh, on dragonflies uh, in the uh, in the freshwater pools there. Uh, some of them can be really nice in the really nice uh, landscape. I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, Marketa Hendrichova will show you uh, very nice uh, pictures uh, of these sites uh, tomorrow, if you haven't seen them yet. And uh, we basically found uh, like uh, almost half of a uh, diversity of species just in a few uh, brown coal spoil heaps. Uh, in the strongly industrial region of our country, and eight of them were threatened, uh, including uh, one endangered and seven uh, vulnerable uh, species, uh, which is quite impressive if you know that uh, uh, we basically surveyed only uh, nine heaps and uh, in the, in, within them only uh, about uh, 60, uh, uh, 60 uh, quite uh, small uh, pools. Uh, and uh, like uh, these, uh, uh, these heaps uh, can actually harbor even uh, very specialized and uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very uh, unique or endangered uh, communities as well. Uh, we focused also on the drainage ditches, so completely artificial um, like uh, structures. In the like within the completely uh, artificial sites, and yeah, these are uh, like uh, spoil heaps, uh, uh, and uh, these uh, uh, ditches were built uh, to basically drain them, uh, which is in generally definitely not a uh, positive. But on the other hand, uh, because they are not so intensive, like these ditches, uh, they are pretty mild. The slope is pretty mild, and so on. So many of them are full of water during the entire year, and they are basically. Uh, serving as a small uh, as a small streams. And basically, the headwaters in the lowland uh, in uh, our part of the world again uh, belong among the most uh, threatened uh, habitats at all. Because you know, in the lowlands, uh, uh, like uh, we use anything uh, where there are nutrients and uh, uh, water. They're trying to use them for agriculture. Already our ancestors did it uh, for centuries. So basically, uh, these uh, ditches were either regulated uh, or uh, they, are, uh, they are basically laying, not or, but and they are laying uh, basically within uh, our most industrialized areas. And they are uh, always polluted uh, by all the herbicides and insecticides and uh, fertilizers and so on uh, from the surrounding uh, fields and uh, this did not happen in uh, these uh, in these uh, large uh, spoil heaps because there is no uh, agriculture no need to use herbicides and insecticides and basically uh, such a nice streams uh, has uh, like uh, been established there and uh, we found there uh, like uh, basically one third on one single uh, spoil heap uh, where we uh, surveyed a few kilometers of these drainage ditches, we found more than one third of uh, all uh, dragonfly species included in the uh, national uh, red list. And some of them are really 
uh, important. For instance, this Cenagrion ornatum, this is the uh, species uh, included in the Natura 2000. So basically, uh, this uh, should be uh, protected in the entire, uh, entire uh, Europe or entire European Union. And uh, we have realized that uh, uh, this species in this single uh, spoil heap is really unique also in its size. Uh, we did some, uh, we did some uh, mark release recapture study and uh, we actually estimated that there is uh, several thousands of uh, specimens of this species, uh, which is probably uh, similar uh, to its population size uh, in the entire Western Europe. And it's definitely uh, by far the richest, uh, the richest population uh, in the Central Europe, like living in the completely uh, artificial structure in the completely uh, artificial habitat. Uh, and I want to mention like uh, as a kind of, uh, let's say extreme or something like that, uh, I want to mention also fly ash deposits uh, because uh, this is a type of post-industrial habitat uh, which uh, uh, my group uh, has been studying uh, for the past uh, uh, several years. And because there are not so uh, many uh, studies of bio uh, on biodiversity of uh, these sites. Uh, and I'm also showing it uh, as an example that uh, like uh, this uh, um, conservation potential of post-industrial sites can be very controversial. Uh, basically fly ash deposits. Um, these are deposits of waste after coal combustion. Uh, they are accompanying at least uh, in Europe, but elsewhere uh, in the world as well, like almost all power stations, heating plants, many factories which are combusting uh, uh, coal as well. So they are pretty common in our landscapes, but uh, many people just even don't know that uh, they exist yeah? uh, because they are always uh, hidden somewhere Yeah, because uh, they are definitely uh, not so uh, beautiful. And especially in the industrial regions with a lot of power stations, uh, they can be very common. Like uh, this is the uh, this is the only map uh, of them which I have found uh, uh, for the Czech Republic. Uh, there is uh, like a few dozens of them, but uh, we know that they are not the only ones, and uh, like uh, maybe even the double. Uh, 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 like a, uh, even even once more of them is actually missing in the map, so it's pretty or relatively, relatively common. And uh, they are characteristic with uh, really specific substrate because this is basically ash. Please don't uh, imagine that this is the ash just like you know it from fireplaces. Uh, the ash is uh, the, like, uh, the, the mineral remnants after the combustion of coal. Uh, so basically minerals uh, uh, with very fine uh, structure, yeah, because uh, coal is uh, firstly grained to uh, basically dust and only then it is combusted. And uh, these are just the parts which were not, able, which were not possible to be uh, combusted. And it's necessary to say that uh, like uh, this uh, fly ash has also strong health risks, uh, dustiness and so on. And uh, when I showed you the picture in my first slide uh, of the uh, industrial area uh, where I have uh, grown, uh, like uh, it was basically this uh, or one of uh, these uh, fly ash deposits. And I always knew that it exists. Uh, I never had any idea that I should basically visit it uh, until I uh, visited some conference where some botanists showed some pictures uh, from uh, of like um, habitats there, and I've realized that it can be really interesting. Uh, basically, when I am when I'm teaching face to face, uh, I'm always uh, trying to uh, like uh, include the students uh, into the lecture. Uh, now uh, in the online mode, this is a bit uh, more difficult, but I'm always uh, showing uh, uh, my audience uh, these two pictures of obviously some uh, habitats uh, uh, which, uh, which resembles uh, some natural sense uh, by the structure of veg vegetation, but of, also by the substrate. Yeah? And I'm asking them which of them is basically natural uh, scent, natural scent dune, and which of them uh, is just a older fly ash deposit. And like they are always uh, guessing which is which. And then I am saying them that this is just a trick because both of these pictures 
are from the fly ash deposits. Yeah, there is no sand in them. There is only uh, the fly ash. But really, if you go there, uh, you realize that they look, uh, they really resemble the natural habitat. And uh, like uh, again, during my doctorate, uh, I was curious if uh, this uh, structure of habitat uh, can resemble uh, drift sands only to us or also uh, to the specialized uh, diversity. And we have realized uh, by intensive surveys uh, that uh, the results were even more optimistic uh, for the nature protection uh, than we expected. And uh, basically we have found quite a lot of uh, species of different groups of insects uh, uh, that uh, uh, were considered to be extinct in our country because, uh, uh, or some of them even in their entire area. And uh, it's because they were very strongly adapted to the open drift uh, sands, which uh, virtually disappeared uh, from Europe, but they fortunately found uh, their secondary refugee in these flash deposits. One example, like uh, this small wasp, uh, called Nisvon hrubanti. Uh, this, this is a species uh, which used to be considered to be a really strong specialist uh, to natural drift sand, uh, to the drift sand dunes. Uh, it used to be known only from Czech Republic, Austria, Hungary, and Slovakia, and from each country only from a few populations. And during the past, I don't know, 30 years, most of this population got extinct and it was uh, considered to be almost extinct in the wild. I think there was just one or two populations uh, known, uh, but we have found it uh, in quite a few uh, fly ash deposits in our country. Uh, we are very happy that uh, this species found uh, its uh, second chance uh, to survive uh, in these uh, industrial, industrial uh, areas and that uh, it is uh, not extinct, which is great. And I already know uh, from recent that uh, now it's even better because uh, mm, there are some uh, restoration of these uh, natural uh, sand uh, dunes, uh, these overgrown and afforested natural sand dunes uh, to uh, like uh, give them back into the state of uh, open habitats with their sands. And uh, it was already observed that uh, this specific species is uh, again spreading from their in, from the industrial sites to the natural ones. So basically, uh, uh, we created some kind of uh, NOAA's arcs uh, for this species and possibly also for others, but we don't have evidence. Uh, and now we are restoring its natural habitats, and uh, it's basically moving uh, back uh, to the normal landscape. Uh, and basically, I'm not sure how is the time? Yeah, I still, I still have quite a, quite some time. Uh, basically, uh, I was also I was also curious uh, if uh, like uh, the cases which we are always finding, we are some exceptions, or uh, if uh, like uh, mm, this is some kind of trend. If basically uh, our uh, our uh, tries, uh, our effort in post-industrial sites uh, can be supporting only a few species, and basically we cannot see uh, 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 we cannot see forests because of the trees here, yeah? uh, or uh, if this is some kind of a general trend and so on. So uh, we did some kind of like preliminary uh, analysis uh, of the red lists of both butterflies and spiders, uh, and uh, we reviewed uh, all. Uh, we reviewed uh, all uh, known uh, records from our mapping databases of uh, both groups uh, and uh, selected those which could be related to post-industrial sites. And basically, uh, I then just quantified uh, what proportion of the species from individual, um, individual red list categories from critically endangered, uh, endangered, vulnerable, nearly threatened and least concerned, so basically these which are somehow uh, stable, uh, occur in the, or regularly occur, are present in the post industrials and uh, most probably they are also reproducing there because com commonly we don't, we are not sure that they, they reproduce, but if we find them repeatedly, uh, we can somehow guess that uh, they are uh, reproducing there. Uh, and you can see that especially for the vulnerable, nearly threatened, endangered uh, butterflies, quite a big share of them is using uh, post-industrial sites uh, for uh, their uh, populations. Uh, for critically endangered, you can see that 
basically not all of them uh, are uh, able to survive or regularly uh, occur in post-industrial sites. But it's not surprising because uh, quite a lot of, or quite a few uh, of these critically endangered species of butterflies are really specialists of, uh, for instance, uh, uh, like a high mountain habitats. And in our high mountains, uh, we have almost no mines because it would be inefficient, of course. Yeah. So uh, even though uh, some parts of our highest mountains are overgrowing, uh, are dis destroyed and so on, uh, we don't have any second chance for them. Uh, plus, uh, some species are uh, specialized for the specific types of habitats, for instance, the peat box. Uh, when I was actually considering uh, these uh, post-industrial sites, uh, I did not uh, include any like a mined uh, peat box there because it's always difficult to define what is still post-industrial, what is not, and so on. Also, the restoration of peat box is more complicated, so I excluded them. And uh, I actually don't even believe that uh, uh, without a uh, very strong conservation effort or conservation management, uh, any mined uh, peat box uh, can really uh, like uh, supplement, like fully supplement uh, the natural peat box here, yeah, like undisturbed peat box. So basically, uh, these remaining species are uh, species of uh, these habitats, which we are not able which are not able uh, to uh, basically create or support uh, in post-industrial sites by any uh, kind of management. In spiders, uh, basically uh, the proportions of uh, species present in post-industrial sites are much smaller. Yeah? Uh, it can be that uh, many spiders cannot actually occur in post-industrial sites, and uh, definitely I'm pretty sure uh, that they cannot because uh, for some uh, like a specialist species like velvet spiders. Uh, I used to uh, supervise uh, some diploma thesis and uh, uh, some students really failed uh, to find uh, like uh, any uh, reproducing uh, spiders of these uh, like flex, uh, flex species uh, in the, uh, even in the like a uh, best looking uh, limestone quarries. Yeah, so some species cannot actually uh, uh, reproduce there and they really need natural semi natural habitats. But on the other hand, uh, like uh, our knowledge of spiders in post-industrial sites are very limited. And uh, besides, uh, uh, besides uh, like uh, studies of uh, my of of my group, uh, there are just uh, uh, let's say, or there there was uh, just uh, or there had been uh, just a few uh, surveys uh, of spiders in quarries and uh, sand pits. Uh, and uh, spoil, uh, spoil heaps until very recently, because nowadays uh, I'm aware about a few other arachnologists who are uh, sampling spiders there. So maybe it's possible uh, that uh, some species are actually missing to be read uh, in these. Okay? Uh, and um, after 10 years, maybe the graph would uh, look like a bit different. But on the other hand, it's also necessary to say that uh, for many most uh, critically endangered uh, uh, species, uh, we definitely need uh, natural and disturbed uh, habitats. Uh, uh, here are just uh, some, sorry, uh, some like a uh, continuing of the uh, uh, of these analyses uh, to basically check uh, species of uh, which habitats uh, are able to uh, are able to colonize uh, these uh, sites and uh, potentially establish their uh, uh, establish their rich populations. Basically, what is important here are these uh, uh, like uh, uh, green parts of the individual bars. Uh, here you can see the butterflies are split into the uh, exactly uh, same uh, habitat categories, just like uh, when I showed you the general decline uh, of butterflies in our country. And you can basically see uh, for uh, some groups, uh, we are able to recreate uh, habitats very efficiently, of course, for generalists, but this is just trivial, but uh, uh, species of uh, like a, uh, early successional and mixed successional dry habitats like grasslands and uh, shrublands, open shrublands, uh, quite a lot of them are, are able uh, to, uh, to, to colonize uh, the uh, post-industrial sites uh, very efficiently. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we are failing, as I already said, uh, in recreating the habitats uh, of species of peat box, 
um, sometimes even for species of wetlands, definitely a species of mountains, uh, but maybe surprisingly you are not so uh, we are not so uh, successful uh, even for uh, the meadow species. Uh, so basically, uh, if uh, I would uh, have been asked, uh, like, uh, what should be the target communities or what should be the target species uh, for the restoration of uh, uh, post-industrial sites, I would always say, let's do it. Uh, for the uh, for the groups with the biggest potential to to create it, and these are basically uh, species of these uh, early successional and mid successional dry habitats. Uh, don't try. I would not even waste uh, our uh, uh, our like resources uh, to uh, recreate some peat bog like peat bog uh, like uh, habitats in these sites. Uh, if I would have, if I would be the decision maker, I would rather invest such available resources uh, to the uh, to the protection and management of the natural peat box. It would be uh, more uh, efficient. Uh, we are failing uh, also in wetlands in post-industrial sites. It's quite often uh, because uh, there are no like real wetlands. If I don't. Uh, consider like the pools as the as the wetland but uh, this is useless for butterflies of course on the other hand uh, they are very uh, efficient they are very precious for dragonflies as I used to uh, as I showed you and uh, that's it okay uh, and then let's go to uh, to the last part of the of the talk about the restoration uh, it will be pretty short uh, because I'm not going to the details. Uh, quite something uh, has already been uh, surely uh, summarized by Jan and some other uh, points of view you will see tomorrow uh, from Marketa. Uh, basically, until very recently in our country, but also in many other countries, uh, we were facing just two really extreme, uh, really extreme uh, uh, ways or approaches how to restore the post-industrial sites. Uh, basically, uh, what I uh, what I observe not only in our country but in like uh, other countries in the world where I travel is a really technical or even technocratical approach of restoration. And uh, this is basically the result of the previous paradigm uh, according to which uh, any post-industrial sites uh, were seen as uh, scarves uh, in the landscape and they basically needed to be somehow healed or completely erased uh, from the uh, uh, from the landscape. So basically uh, they were remodeled uh, by the uh, heavy machinery, they were covered by the nutri nutrient rich uh, uh, topsoils and quite often uh, they were also like uh, supported by planting of trees, uh, like a uh, sowing of uh, like species poor uh, commercial mixtures of grasses and herbs and so on. So basically the habitats look uh, completely different than the industrial sites. And at the opposite, uh, like uh, opposite side of the gradient of what you can do uh, with the uh, with restoration of the post-industrial sites, uh, it was like a like a full leaving of the site to spontaneous succession. Uh, it was very typical in the past because uh, uh, quite often there was uh, uh, no like uh, resources to do anything with that. Uh, in many cases and so on. And they were left for a spontaneous succession, succession for decades. And this is exactly the case when in many of them, not in all, many of them were completely uh, lost uh, because of succession overgrowing or some other problems, pollution or whatever. But in many of them, uh, this is the way how this uh, uh, mosaic of natural habitats have been created. Of course, uh, nowadays uh, we have modern approaches in restoration of these sites, uh, like various ways of ecological uh, restoration, of uh, like uh, uh, assisted restoration, and uh, other other ways. And uh, of course, it could be best. But uh, for our comparisons, uh, we were focusing on these uh, two extremes because they are still pretty common in uh, many uh, regions. Yeah. Let's keep this. Um, this is the first uh, study from Central Europe uh, focusing on this uh, to compare uh, diversity uh, of, in this case, plants uh, in uh, technically reclaimed and spontaneously uh, developed uh, sites. 
uh, in uh, brown coal spoil uh, 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 heaps uh, in uh, north uh, uh, northwestern Bohemia, so basically in the region uh, of my origin. And uh, even if you check it, like uh, this technical reclamation has created uh, some, let's say, boring uh, production meadows, pretty uh, similar to the common ones in the agricultural, intensive uh, agricultural landscape, whilst the spontaneous succession in many cases uh, really created some interesting uh, uh, mosaic of uh, various habitats. But basically, it's not surprising that much higher diversity of plants including some pretty nice orchids actually occurred uh, in these uh, um, sites left to spontaneous succession. And what is also, uh, what is also uh, actually um, interesting or very interesting is that uh, uh, like uh, uh, these uh, sites, they're very commonly uh, invaded uh, by the uh, aggressive expansive species of grasses uh, and other aliens, uh, in this case mainly Calamagrostis epigeus, which is actually not alien in our part of the world, but uh, it's very expansive and competitionally uh, strong and it's one of the big problems of our, uh, of our uh, country. So, uh, uh, we are basically suppressing diversity by these uh, technical reclamations, but we are also given more chance uh, to the uh, problematic uh, competitive species. Since that time, there were already numerous studies of various groups from, from uh, plants through various groups of insects uh, up to uh, birds uh, in different, uh, different types of post-industrial sites. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, spoil heaps and other spoil heaps like black coal spoil heaps, uh, limestone quarries, flash deposits, sand pits, and very consistently technical reclamation uh, is always the best, uh, the, the sorry, the worst, the, the bad uh, solution, which is suppressing diversity and uh, giving chance to uh, aggressive, uh, competitively uh, strong uh, species. So basically, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's that. Just skip over this. Uh, I just, uh, oh, I would just shorten it. Uh, for the freshwater habitats, I just, uh, I'm just always saying that it's a bit more complicated uh, because in many cases uh, the artificial uh, pools or artificial drainage ditches are of a, a similar conservation value to those uh, which uh, were established spontaneously, uh, and uh, it's because uh, in many cases. Uh, like uh, our uh, restoration practitioners, uh, they know how to recreate valuable habitats uh, in freshwater and they spend uh, much more effort uh, to it uh, than, uh, for the, uh, than for the terrestrial uh, habitats. So basically their diversity or conservation value uh, is uh, like similar to those uh, established naturally. And uh, in the case of uh, drainage dishes, completely ditches, sorry, uh, completely artificial uh, construction, uh, the conservation value can be really uh, amazing. Uh, with the flash deposits, it's of course a bit more complicated because in limestone quarries and spoil heaps, uh, there is a, like presumably absolutely no problem with uh, pollution uh, or toxicity, but uh, in flash deposits there actually is. And of course, uh, like the restoration uh, must always take into consideration prevention of wind erosion, so stabilize the, sub stabilize the substrate, cover it by topsoils and so on. Uh, but uh, this, uh, like, uh, this original aim or result, the complete eradication from the landscape uh, is all, of course problematic uh, from the point of view of the endangered uh, diversity. Because if you create something like that, uh, which is basically uh, just a species poor grassland uh, with uh, like a no chance uh, for these uh, uh, like a extinct or almost extinct species of drift sands. Uh, this is always uh, like a the lost chance, I would say. Uh, and uh, because uh, there was, uh, before our research, there was uh, no knowledge about uh, the diversity or conservation potential of these sites, and there was also uh, no uh, methods, uh, potential methods for the efficient, uh, uh, efficient uh, restoration. So we did some studies and we actually uh, realized that uh, after some time, uh, even naturally, 
uh, although the, the habitats are like quite extreme, uh, they can be really overheated during uh, during uh, summer. Uh, they are very strongly desiccative. Uh, they are uh, very uh, uh, very sensitive to wind erosion and so on. They stabilize. Uh, they are partially covered uh, by vegetation. Some of them are even like almost fully covered by uh, by uh, vegetation. And we have actually realized that in on, like basically all the cases. Uh, these habitats uh, are uh, more uh, species, uh, more conservation valued uh, than if you create their artificial meadow or artificial forest. Uh, for different groups, it, ver it works differently. Uh, like uh, bees, for instance, because they are uh, they are nesting in uh, bare ground. They like uh, these either dry or wet uh, bare substrate. While spiders, because you know they live more in the 3D world because of their hunting, because of their building of uh, webs and so on, uh, they actually the, the most uh, uh, or some of the most threatened species uh, they uh, they liked or they they preferred uh, this already let's say kind of mature uh, successionally mature uh, habitats. And uh, then uh, we were uh, more communicating with the practitioners and we have uh, realized that uh, during the restoration, they are very often uh, using for stabilization of substrate to basically covering it, covering the fly ash with a very thin uh, layer of, uh, of the bare soil, uh, basically uh, soil, uh, which is some kind of a, a side product uh, of some construction, construction work and so on. It's useless for nothing because there are uh, new, uh, no nutrients. Uh, so they are using it for this, uh, they call it preparation for restoration. Uh, and we have actually realized that uh, if you do this, uh, you don't bring uh, too much uh, nutrients uh, to the fly ash deposit. Uh, you basically uh, stabilize the substrate. There is almost no erosion, uh, but there is still about, I don't know, 20 or 30 uh, percent after the strong rains, uh, like uh, uh, this, uh, some small parts in the mosaic uh, uh, of this uh, fly ash are actually exposed. And there is about 20, 30 percent, something like that. Uh, and this is enough for uh, nesting of many of these specialized species, uh, especially if you have the large area of the entire uh, fly ash deposits, these small pieces together are already creating uh, quite a large part. And uh, this could be one of the ways to basically uh, decrease dustiness and keep, uh, keep the uh, keep the conservation potential for the most uh, specialized species. This is how it looks like if you uh, bring there like a fertile topsoil, it basically overgrows uh, by many like uh, invasive species or expensive species uh, of uh, grasses and herbs. Uh, and uh, like this is not good for the diversity. And if you actually don't bring uh, the um, don't bring the uh, the not fertile topsoil there, uh, like uh, many uh, many parts of the uh, fly ash uh, stays for at least decades, uh, uh, not overgrown by any vegetation, which is good for diversity. Yeah, like uh, many nice species nest here. But this is definitely bad uh, for the public health and the environmental uh, pollution because, of course, this is very uh, sensitive to wind erosion. So basically, this can be the chance. Okay? And uh, time. Okay, I will just uh, skip over uh, skip over this because uh, I, I think I've already said it, or I'm sure I'm already I've already said it. And uh, so just some continuing of the uh, continuing of the analysis with what species we are able to uh, we are able to protect uh, protect we are able to give chance uh, by restoration of uh, post-industrial sites. And now just a few uh, case studies like uh, about the restoration, like uh, how to how to restore it wisely. Uh, so basically, it is necessary to really keep uh, or support the heterogeneity of habitats or heterogeneity of uh, terrain uh, in the uh, uh, in the post-industrial sites to really support the diversity there. Uh, this is actually a study which uh, we did together uh, with Jan. Uh, this is from his model uh, landscape of the Sokolov uh, lignite spoil heaps. Uh, 
I suppose he used to, uh, he already showed you how uh, this heaping is uh, working and there is like a big railway on which uh, this uh, heaper is actually uh, moving on and like, uh, like dumping uh, or depositing uh, the spoil. So the result are these uh, like so-called fingers with these small uh, waves. Okay? Uh, this, is how, this is the result of that. And from some reason, which I don't understand much, is that uh, the practitioners, the restoration practitioners, don't like uh, this uh, heterogeneous uh, terrain, this heterogeneous uh, surface, and they're always uh, leveling it, flattening it, even in the, in the uh, parts which uh, they plan uh, to keep it for some kind of uh, natural succession or uh, ecological restoration, they at least uh, level it. And this is very, uh, very like uh, you lose the heterogeneity of the conditions uh, and uh, like typically quite uh, uh, fast, it is overgrown by this Calamagrostis epigeos, whilst these waves are actually keeping uh, their heterogeneous uh, characters uh, for decades. And basically we simply, uh, we simply uh, compare the diversity of uh, uh, several groups of uh, uh, insects and uh, other arthropods uh, of these uh, wavy lands and these uh, flattened lands. And uh, unsurprisingly, uh, this is supporting uh, much uh, uh, bigger diversity, especially speaking about uh, protected uh, uh, threatened species. Uh, yeah, and uh, just uh, speaking about uh, the succession, I have just uh, stated repeatedly that uh, succession, like spontaneous succession and spontaneous uh, natural processes uh, in the restoration uh, can be really beneficial, can be the way how to do it. Uh, but I will now tell you that this is not the entire truth. Uh, this is actually uh, my very first study of, of diversity uh, in uh, any quarry. At that time, I used to be working uh, with spiders, and uh, uh, we were assembling uh, like spiders in several uh, quarries in the Piedmont area, uh, in the wet area, where like uh, the development of uh, like uh, step like grasslands and so on is uh, pretty. Uh, unrealistic and unexpected and so on. But we have still uh, realized that uh, after a like, few decades of natural succession, uh, there are still quiet uh, open uh, habitats uh, 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 in, the, in the granite mountain, uh, in the granite quarry, uh, which was actually uh, uh, like inhabited by uh, various uh, threatened and regionally rare spider species. And which are, these are typically spiders uh, which really like uh, like a uh, warm and dry grasslands, like uh, these uh, barren lands and so on, and which are very rare in that uh, uh, relatively cold and relatively uh, wet region. So this used to be some kind of a, like a regional uh, a regional hotspot of uh, rare uh, diversity. But uh, I I was actually resampling this area uh, for uh, several years, uh, like for. 15 or something like that. Uh, this is just uh, one uh, picture from like the, the half of the study or something like that. Uh, and uh, because of the succession, although on the aerial picture, the changes are not so big, uh, it's necessary to say that the, all the trees and shrubs uh, grew uh, much taller. Uh, they started to shade the microhabitats. Also the litter uh, was uh, much um, thicker uh, uh, and commoner and it completely changed the microhabitats and basically all these uh, uh, regionally rare spiders and also carabids, carabid beetles uh, disappear. Yeah. So basically even the nat natural succession is uh, with time leading to some unwanted uh, results and uh, basically it can erase the unique uh, uh, habitats or the kind of secondary uh, uh, precious habitats uh, from the from the sites. How to how to actually um, suppress this? Uh, we can use some additional disturbances. Okay? Uh, you know, like the entire habitat was basically created by the disturbance. Uh, so uh, if we uh, want to uh, maintain its uh, character for longer time, uh, we can support it by some 
other disturbances. Ideally, some uh, disturbances or management, which is cheap, uh, which is serving for something else, and which is somehow related uh, to other human activities as well. So with uh, some other colleagues, uh, we did some study of uh, diversity uh, of uh, sand pits in southern Bohemia, in some part of our country. Uh, there is quite a lot of uh, sand pits where we sampled, again, uh, uh, plants and uh, several groups of uh, insects and uh, spiders. And we actually realized that uh, 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 some of these uh, sand pits uh, are actually used uh, for uh, recreational activities, uh, typically uh, as a playing ground uh, for kids or uh, as a beaches uh, for uh, like uh, swimming people and so on. And this is actually disturbing uh, the habitats and keeping them open. And uh, it's basically what uh, most of these groups uh, need. If you needed to spontaneous succession, it's true that uh, many of the parts uh, uh, are staying, uh, are staying uh, open or semi-open for decades. But what is bad is that uh, like uh, there is a stabilization of the substrate of these uh, sands. Like this is not drift sand, this is the normal sand. So this is uh, more sensitive to the natural uh, stabilization. And for, for instance, for many uh, solitary bees, uh, it's already too hard uh, to basically dig their nests there. And uh, if they reclaimed it technically or technocratically, they basically uh, like establish there the monoculture of uh, pine trees and uh, it shouldn't be uh, surprising for you already that this is not what the uh, threatened uh, species uh, need. Another example in the Kladno, uh, Kladno region, the spoil dumps are used uh, for various activities, which we definitely don't want to have in normal landscape. So various motocrossing, off-roading and uh, so on. Uh, and we have realized uh, basically this is what, uh, uh, what uh, many of these uh, dumps uh, is uh, keeping uh, uh, like uh, the natural, uh, sorry, the, the open character. Yeah? Uh, this is the typical example of the small one. This is one of the smallest. Uh, you, you can see it's completely surrounded uh, by, the, uh, by the fields uh, and the only like open and bare uh, surface areas there are definitely maintained by the motocross. And this is uh, the picture from the uh, upper part uh, of the largest spoil dump there uh, in the region. And uh, you can see that the motocross is actually uh, uh, disturbing its surface here as well. And uh, like, especially in this uh, specific uh, particular uh, site, uh, there is some kind of, uh, like, let's say, uh, agreement or some kind of uh, consensus in between these uh, motocrossers and the local conservation uh, officers, and they are communicating together and they are always saying, uh, hey guys, uh, you already disturbed this part too much, so you should move uh, a bit, just like 20 meters, and leave this uh, to be like uh, uh, overgrown a bit again and uh, disturb rather these, uh, uh, these uh, already two overgrown parts and so on. And this is completely maintaining, this is completely sufficient to maintain there the habitat mosaic, which is hosting uh, the, the high diversity and uh, which is basically for free. Yeah. Uh, plus uh, it serves uh, uh, as a playground for some people who we definitely don't want to be, for instance, uh, like destroying our nature reserves or whatever. Yeah. And we actually shown uh, that uh, this motocrossing or secondary excavation, because uh, people there, they are like uh, basically excavating some of these spoils to, I don't know, build uh, some parts in their gardens and so on, or this is trampled uh, by like uh, tourists or normal people because uh, these uh, dumps, uh, uh, they are like a uh, Cardano region, it's quite a flatland. And uh, these uh, dumps are basically creating uh, some kind of uh, like uh, viewpoints and so on. So some of them are very, uh, very uh, favorite uh, by normal people. And this trampling, this excavation, this motocross is really supporting uh, uh, threatened butterflies and richness of uh, plants. Uh, and the last uh, question, can we really ignore post-industrial sites? Can we really ignore uh, their, uh, their uh, conservation potential? I'm coming back to the beginning of my talk. Uh, again, the model landscape of Kolabi, this northern part of our country, uh, like uh, these drifts and dunes along the Alba River. 
Uh, now I can send, uh, I can finally tell you that uh, besides these uh, yellow dots, there are also the red dots. I didn't mention them on purpose before uh, because you, that time you still didn't know what the fly ash deposits are. Now I can tell you that these are the four large uh, fly ash deposits in the area. And uh, we basically quantified uh, or measured, yeah, the, um, like uh, the area of these uh, remnants of drift sand dunes. This is the largest of them. And this is how typically uh, they look like. So you can see this is really like a, uh, this is smaller than like typical lecture room or like smaller than uh, like playground uh, for kids or something like that. And uh, we uh, quantified the, uh, the area of the bare substrate and the area uh, of the uh, sparse uh, grasslands uh, on both uh, sand dunes and uh, fly ash deposits. And here you can see the result, yeah? Like um, if you quantify uh, the area of the sand dunes, we are somewhere about two hectares in the entire uh, area where the sand uh, uh, dunes used to be uh, very common. Whilst uh, if you consider fly ashes, uh, like, uh, of course, like something like uh, 85 hectares is not the best, but it's many, many times more uh, than these natural habitats. And as I said, uh, our idea is basically that uh, uh, at this moment, uh, the fly ash deposits would serve as some kind of refugees of these uh, NOAX arcs. And uh, once uh, our society will be, like, let's say, mature enough to uh, like uh, uh, restore these natural habitats in the sand dunes, we have some chance that a part of the diversity will survive in these, uh, in these uh, secondary habitats. And that's all from me. Uh, if you have any questions, just ask me now or write me an email later. Uh, you can also check uh, the, um, the uh, web page of our uh, insect uh, community research group. I must admit, this is not so up to date. There are not uh, everything, but you can download uh, these uh, like uh, popular books about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, conservation potential of post-industrial sites and their restoration. And one of them is even fully in English. So you can go there. So that's all. Uh, whoever has uh, any question, just don't hesitate to ask. Okay, I can see some feedback in, in, in the chat. So I see that somebody is still here. Uh, if you are too shy, just don't hesitate and write your comment or uh, question into the chat. I will try to uh, read it. Okay, so I hope that uh, uh, I didn't bore you or something like that. I just suppose that uh, you are uh, already exhausted after the uh, several days of the summer school. So maybe you don't want to discuss it now, but as I said, feel free to send me any question by email. Uh, I'm happy to discuss it later. Mr. Tropek, we have some question from a chat. Uh, the construction of refugees with stones will promote interbreed uh, diversity from Mr. Ms. Sarah Palace. Uh, I'm not sure I understand well. Uh, like uh, basically uh, like stones as a stones, like big boulders or something like that. Uh, some of them can be really used by some solitary bees for uh, nesting uh, and so on. Uh, but generally it's like stones are important to have in quarries and in natural habitats and so on. But I don't think that these are really 
the most important thing, yeah, like really the, uh, the, 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 the squeeze or gravel beds or uh, scent uh, or like uh, sparse grasslands are most um, are more important for many invertebrates. Yeah, hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yes, I have a question. So I want to, regarding the presentation, sorry, I joined late, maybe I might have uh, missed the part uh, with respect to conservation of uh, post-industrial site. I want to know if there is any classical example or case study where a particular post-industrial site has been conserved due to uh, presence of uh, a specific uh, rare uh, endangered uh, species. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, I didn't use many like these, uh, let's say, success stories or something like that because it would be already too long. But in our country and also in other parts of the world, I know many projects, uh, there are like numerous uh, like uh, success projects and there are also numerous failure projects. Yeah? Uh, and uh, I would actually uh, recommend you to basically go to our website to, oh, yeah. to download the book with this uh, nice uh, frog, uh, tree frog on the, uh, on the cover because uh, there are numerous uh, successful cases uh, like uh, described, mentioned with many pictures and so on. Because uh, now I can hardly go to details. I can just tell you that uh, we have like uh, numerous successful stories of restoration uh, where mm, like uh, we knew that there is some occurrence of uh, like important species of either plant or invertebrate or invertebrates uh, in specific site. And the management and the restoration was basically uh, uh, like a established or written or planned according to this species. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the habitat was efficiently uh, like a, either supported or even re-established to support the species. Yeah, so, so it exists. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so it seems that there is no more questions. As I say, don't hesitate to write me an email or like, uh, contact me some otherwise. And thanks to Honza Jan, who is already not yeah, here. Yes, so I would like I would like thank to Robert for this excellent overview. And uh, tomorrow morning we will have uh, Marketa Henrikova about this landscape aspect of restoration. Thank you for listening to me and bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.